Guess what? I'm sitting on a new log today, and this is going to be part of our Soul of the Tree series that we started in January 2020. Our promise to you is that for every new species that we cut, we're going to document it and give you the first peek inside to see the heart or the soul of the tree. Now this is a truly unique stump. It's a sinker cypress stump. It was actually excavated near the Mississippi River about 30 feet underground. Yes, that's right, 30 feet underground. Now it is believed to be prehistoric in nature. Now, ultimately, this stump is going to be carbon dated by the University of Arkansas. I've been told that by the client, and we will share that information with, with you. Now, in the meantime, what I want to do for this video is just show you the arrival of this stump, us moving this beast around. It's about 10,000 pounds, and it's a really awkward thing to move. We also pressure washed it for over three hours to try to remove all this prehistoric mud and muck. And then we're going to go ahead and trim it up with a special carbide blade that is made to go through dirt, rocks, metal, just nasty stuff. Then we're going to set it up on our sawmill. We're going to mill it. And of course, finally, the exciting part will be showing you the sole of the tree inside this Louisiana sinker cypress stump. So guess what? Let's get to work. All right, so we're done with the pressure washing. You know, we could spend another two, three hours and maybe get another 10, 15% of this mud out of here. But you can see this tap root, which is right here. We're able to actually go all the way in to the bottom and we can see in all these crevices now. Now, of course, there is mud. We're not gonna get it pressed steam, but we're gonna do as best we can with the, the minimal amount of time spent on this. So three hours is about as max as we're gonna do. Um, if not, we're just kind of burning time and burning money at that point. But I'm pretty happy with the end result. The real question now is just going to be what is inside this? What objects are hiding inside this thing? And we really hope that we don't hit anything so hard that we can't actually cut through it because that's a big pain in the butt if we do hit an object and have to pull the blade out backwards. But if we do, we will show you that process. Okay, aren't you glad that muddy mess is over? Guess what? What's funny is that I didn't have to do much of that work. So thanks guys for getting to be mud monsters. So at this point, this is my challenge. I've got to do an assessment on the stump to best figure out how to actually put it onto our sawmill safely. But not only that, to get the best quality and yield out of this thing. So this stump is definitely far too big to put on our sawmill without trimming it down to safely sawmill it. So we're gonna cut it down on the width to somewhere under 70 inches. Now what I wanna do in an optimal scenario is maximize the height of the log on our sawmill so I can get more cuts or more lumber or more slabs for the client. So I think it's somewhere over 80 inches right now. I'm 6'5", it's pretty close to me on this side. So let's look at some measurements and some areas also that it's gonna sit flat and be well supported on the cants of the sawmill.
Okay, so we know that the height off the ground right now is about 67, 66 inches. So no trimming involved if we can, if we can actually rotate this log 90 degrees and set it up on the sawmill. Now what I want to verify is the width. I want this width to be 80 plus inches so we can get more lumber out of it from top to bottom. So let's check that out right now too. Yeah, without a doubt. So my eyes aren't too bad yet at my old age of 43. Um, it was about 98 inches. So no doubt about it that we need to rotate this log 90 degrees and we're going to gain about 20 more inches of cut material to give more lumber back to our client and we don't have to trim for the cut capacity of our sawmill. We're good there. Now I am going to mark knock off some of this loose stuff um, it's just bad for the blade and could damage the blade but for the most part this is a really good size stump for our WM 1000 which is one of the biggest thin kerf wide capacity sawmills built in North America right now okay I had to run back to the shop real quick to grab this saw this is actually a Husqvarna 395 XP it's actually been um, bored out and hot rotted so it's hundred cc's had port work done awesome saw love it heavy saw kinda hard to start but once it gets going it will mow through material like nothing else I apologize real quick I've got a couple young kids in the background riding dirt bikes on the property so I apologize if there's a little background noise but real quick let's talk about the bar this is just a 54 inch bar and I've got a skip tooth chain on it right now I'm gonna pull this chain it's been freshly sharpened in our shop if I use this chain on that log of course it's dirty it will just ruin this and dull it almost instantly now luckily we had a project which was a very challenging live oak removal on Lake Austin. Now we had to cut literally a 20,000 plus pound stump in half and the way that we got that accomplished was a, was a true specialty blade. It was this blade right here. Now this is a, over a $300 blade. It was designed and it's engineered for search and rescue teams firefighters, etc., for really dirty, nasty environments where you got to cut through rocks, sometimes into metal, etc. So this blade is going to get it done. The problem and the question that I have is, unfortunately, I forgot to send it in to get it resharpened. We can't do it at the shop here because it's a specialty blade. So it's been fairly well used. If you're curious about the use of it, check out this video of this live oak, which is just a quick time lapse video of uh, some of our early grueling removal work um, around Texas. So, hey, let's get to it. Let me pop off this chain. I'm going to pop the carbide on. I also noticed that I had a crack in this handle, so I'm going to go ahead and replace it with a new OEM that I happen to have in the shop, too. And then we'll go mark the log, and hopefully, we'll get a nice flat cut so we can set this log on the deck of our sawmill really, really nicely with good stability. Okay, let me clean this up a little more and I just want to give you a close up of the carbide itself so you can see this is brazed this is the actual carbide tooth that is brazed onto this chain this is what makes it a specialty chain and also a very expensive chain as I noted we've actually have a full day of really dirty cutting on this so I'm hoping we can still get another hour or so to trim this cypress log before we have to send it off but hey let's go find out all right, so we're all ready to trim this thing off so it can sit flat on the deck. Real quick, safety precautions. Of course, any time you use a chainsaw, I cannot stress this enough, guys. We're all smart enough to use hearing protection, eye protection, chaps. Chaps, chaps, chaps. Look, I know they can be a pain to put on. I know they can be uncomfortable. I know they can get hot. You need to wear them. I always haven't been perfect about it. 
but I've made a big effort in the last couple years to make sure I'm always putting these chaps on. Believe me, they'll save you some heartache and potentially some really big injuries. So please use chaps. Okay, I'll call that a success. You know, that blade wasn't exactly sharp, but it definitely got the job done. I'm gonna have to send a reminder to myself to make sure to ship that thing out to get it sharpened so the next time this happens, we're ready to go. Now, I think I've got this cut right where I need to have it. We're gonna find out. So this is gonna be what the surface or the face of this stump that's gonna lay on the deck of the sawmill. Then the only thing we'll need to do at that point is raise up this nose end so we're making a perfectly perpendicular cut um, for the dead center of this log. And you'll see more. We've actually done a video about center cutting pit logs that you can check out here to get a better idea of what I'm talking about when I'm referring to centering a pith. Outside of that, real quick, I'm getting more and more excited about this, folks. I'm starting to see signs that there's gonna be some different coloration in here. Now Cypress usually is just a light, pretty uniform wood. It's not known for its color, but that's where sinker logs are so popular. All the mineral deposits from being submerged over a period of time create some really cool coloration. It's almost like staining or dyeing the inside heart of these logs. So, you know, I'm starting to have a little bit of a feel that maybe we're going to see some pretty cool color in this. So, at this point, I've got the challenge of trying to transport this from our forklift onto the deck and getting it on there flatly, safely, and ready to go for tomorrow when the client shows up and we actually mill this puppy. So that wasn't too bad at all. I just basically dragged it out of here. That's good enough. Now, at this point, I'm going to rotate it over to get it fall, to fall flat on this flat face surface. Then hopefully I'll be able to come on this side, pick it right up, and drop it onto the deck of our sawmill. So let's keep our fingers crossed for another positive outcome. All right. Yes, so far so good. This is exactly what I had envisioned. I'm not envisioning this thing coming rolling off of this thing. So this is our biggest challenge at this point is getting on this deck, getting it stabilized and preventing it from rolling off the deck, especially backwards or on the far side of our deck. So one thing I decided to do real quick is I'm gonna put a ratchet strap, a 10,000 pound ratchet strap around the top of this to prevent this thing from falling forward. I'll then be able to shim it and secure it before I actually pull the forks out, or at least that's the goal.
All right, great. So at this point, I'm happy with it. It's stable. It's not going anywhere. Now, of course, there's a really tall center of gravity on this thing. So we need to make sure that we're being safe when we're milling it and milling it slow. When I get to about here, it's all good at that point. So I'll be a little nervous until then. So we still have to trim it up. One thing I'm really happy about though, is that I have five points of contact. I've created one in the front. I've got one on this side, one on the back side, one on this side, and one on the back side. So that makes me feel really happy. I like to have at least five or six points of contact just in case something slips. The whole raw log isn't gonna fail at that point. So we'll keep at it and we'll keep trying to stay safe. I need to be below this cross member um, for us to be able to clear the top of this log. So we're gonna have to put a platform up here so I can safely stand and comfortably stand to be able to give this thing a buzz cut. So let's do it. Hey, I've got an intermission. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sitting here in front of another cypress log, but this is a Texas cypress. But in terms of this sinker log, I've decided to break this up into two parts. This effort occurred over three days, and we have over 10 hours of video footage. I didn't anticipate the video to be this long, but I wanted to show as much detail as I could and really show you the type of effort that we make here at the Texas Urban Sawmill. So part two, which I'm posting right here, is gonna go into the milling operation itself. And then of course, we're gonna show you the sole of the tree with lots of detail of the grain, the color, and the character, of course. By the way, this is our third in the series. This bald cypress log has a crazy unique history in itself. It's actually been salvaged basically twice. So if you're interested in learning more about this log, I'm gonna post it sometime in March and we'll keep it up for every new species. I make that promise to you that we'll make sure to, soul, to show you the soul of the tree. All right, I gotta get back to work now.